uh, it's our pleasure to announce uh, Professor uh, Ali uh, Inayat from University of uh, Göteborg, um, from Sweden. Uh, he's a mathematical logician with a strong interest in the metal mathematicals of foundational axiomatic systems such as ZF and PA. His approach is dominantly model theoretic and has focused on fragment of ZF. ZF with large cardinals, uh, coin, Jason, CD theory, and the uh, arithmetical system of, of various flavors, ranging from fragments of PA to fragments of second order arithmetic. His uh, research work is focused on model theory of arithmetic and uh, CD theory and uh, axiomatic theory of truth, and he is an expert in this field. Okay, let's welcome his uh, lectures. His title is a tax series. Okay, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks again to the organizers of this uh, very impressive uh, workshop. Um, so I will be, uh, as uh, the title says, talking about uh, tight theories. Uh, these are theories, of course, that I will define very carefully. Uh, I will begin by uh, pointing to some uh, work that is connected to this talk. Uh, I would like to think of it as a story. Um, so uh, the story begins with uh, a paper of Albert Fisser um, that you see on the screen, Categories of Theories and Interpretations, um, um, that it was, it was published in 2006, but the paper um, in preprint form had been around for at least a few years before that. Um, in this paper, there, there are lots of good stuff, um, and I'll be focusing on one particular, I would say, seed, that is now developed basically uh, in this talk and uh, in some papers I'll point out to. Um, okay, so the story was continued in a later paper uh, that I wrote uh, in 2016. Um, it's, it, it appeared on this, in this volume in honor of Albert, but it's also available online. If you just uh, search for it, uh, you'll be able to find a, a free copy. Um, and then, um, um, more recently, in a paper by uh, Joe David Hamkins and Alfredo Roque Freire um, in Journal of Symbolic Logic, uh, the theme is continued uh, in the context of set theory. Um, I will provide, of course, all kinds of explanations of how, how these papers are related and what are the results in it uh, as we go down the road. Um, there are also connections. Uh, with a notion uh, studied by Yoko Vanonen and uh, Tong Wang uh, in their 2015 paper. Um, the notion is called internal categoricity. Um, so this was developed, um, as you see in two papers, uh, uh, a more later one um, is in 2019 in the Bulletin of Symbolic Logic. Um, I will be in this talk also referring to some unpublished work of mine that, are, that is connected to this theme. Okay, so this is just the overall framework of uh, some giving some pointers to some references and, and, and some years of basically uh, where they were published. Um, so let's begin with um, Albert Fisher's theorem, the one that basically is the point of departure for uh, the ideas in this talk. Um, the theorem uh, involves a notion that is in blue here called retract that I'll define very carefully, but for the moment, think of it as um, half of by interpretability. So if you have two extensions of a piano arithmetic and you've closed these extensions under um, first order deductions, so they're not just axioms, but you close them under, um, under uh, their consequences and U and B are in the same language as arithmetic. So these are important um, Pre preconditions for the theorem, uh, then as soon as you know that U is a retract of V, uh, then you know that uh, V is a subset of U. Um, and in particular, because I just said intuitively being a retract is about, it means half of being bi-interpretable. Uh, this in particular gives you a remarkable fact about extensions of piano arithmetic that uh, if two extensions of piano arithmetic are bi-interpretable, then they're the same. So it, it, it puts uh, piano arithmetic in a very special place as having some sort of natural completeness um, that um, 
that is given by uh, by this last part of the uh, of what you're seeing on the screen uh, that you cannot uh, expect to extend piano arithmetic in in two different ways so that there is a by interpretation between them which i'll of course go over exactly what that means but think of it as a two-way street uh, without the two theories being the same okay so i will give all kinds of explanations and uh context for what these notions mean, but at least we have a point of departure for the talk in terms of a specific theorem. Um, later, we will be also seeing an outline of the proof of the theorem. Um, so let's now go back and do some basics. So in the next few slides, uh, I wanna walk through some um, rudiments of interpretability theory. Uh, it's a subject that has gained more attention uh, in the last maybe decade or so, but it goes back uh, to the original work that uh, Tarski did with Robinson and Mostovsky um, in, in proving um, very important undecidability results. Um, and there have been lots of interesting work uh, done on this topic by uh, a number of people, including Harvey Friedman and Albert Fisser and a number of other luminaries. Um, here, I, I wanna go through the basics because it, it still is not part and parcel. Interpretability is still not part and parcel of a basic logic education. It might be down the road. It might be as maybe in a, maybe 10 years down the road, it would be in, in many textbooks. But right now it's not. It's just you have to go and find little bits and pieces in different places. Okay, um, to make things easier, um, I would assume that the theories we're looking at uh, are formulated in a relational language and we have a definable pairing function. This will allow me to go through these definitions a bit quicker. Um, so um, we, interpretability is a relationship between theories. So um, uh, these theories are gonna be called U and V. Uh, the language of these theories uh, is are L and U and, and L of V. And uh, an interpretation written um, I going from, as if it's a function from U to V is given by a translation, a translation tau which translates each LU formula, phi, into an LV formula, phi with a superscript tau. Remember tau is a translation. Now this translation should uh, uh, be subject to certain natural conditions. Uh, first of all, if it's gonna be an interpretation of U and V, uh, V should be able to prove the translation of phi uh, for each phi in U. Now, the translation itself, how is that given? Well, uh, it should be, First of all, we should have a, a notion of a domain of discourse given by a formula called the domain formula. It tells you what kind of objects are you looking at to be able to make a universe out of those kind of objects. Um, and um, it should also tell you how to translate um, each specific predicate P into a formula. So each specific predicate of U is translated into a formula of, um, of V. Um, and Moreover, um, once you have this, this uh, correspondence between a predicate and a formula, um, and also have you specified the domain of discourse, then you lift it to the full language uh, by making it commute with propositional connectives. And, uh, and also, uh, these are the conditions you want to impose on, uh, on quantifiers, uh, which is exactly the kind of things you would write down if you were to be writing a natural translation of one theory into another theory. Um, so um, we will be writing, um, instead of writing sometimes uh, U is interpretable in V, we just uh, will be seeing this symbol U triangle less than V. So the uh, less than or equal to basically says, it gives you a chance that, uh, that you could also go the other way around. Um, and um, um, so that's a notion of uh, interpretable and then to be mutually interpretable uh, means you can go both ways. You can, you can interpret U in V and also V in U. Um, and uh, I find this example, uh, or at least this row of examples here that I'm pointing to here uh, uh, to be typically when I uh, try to explain interpretations to um, logicians, uh, it kind of covers a number of uh, interesting, very interesting ideas. So uh, um, let's look at the, uh, this part, um, RCF stands for real closed fields. Um, ACF zero stands for algebraically closed fields of characteristics zero. So when you think of RCF, think of the 
real field, field of real numbers as the canonical model of the natural model, the standard model of RCF and the complex field as ACF. So the fact that we can interpret um, complex numbers in real numbers goes back to, um, to uh, 19th century, goes back to uh, Hamilton. You could, but that of course was, was uh, pre-logic. Uh, in our modern parlance, we could actually um, think about the fact that uh, complex multiplication can be defined in terms of real multiplication. Now here, of course, for ACF, you need to be able to use uh, pairs of numbers and that violates my simplification hypothesis from the previous page because I, I, I assume we have a pairing function. If you let that go, if you become more relaxed about um, having that pairing function, then the idea is that your domain of discourse in this case would be pairs of real numbers. And, um, and that allows you to interpret ACF in RCF. But uh, some basic facts about uh, stable uh, theories allows you to see that you cannot go the other way around. Um, so ACF zero, cannot interpret RCF. Uh, and then look at the other extreme um, on, this, on this page. Uh, the fact that we can interpret piano arithmetic in ZF is what we learn um, in our first course, typically in set theory, where we see how the von Neumann ordinals um, satisfy, uh, once, you, once you define plus and times on them, um, satisfy the action for PA. Um, and then takes uh, a bit of more work, for example, using Tarski's uh, undefined degree of truth theorem to, to see that piano arithmetic um, is, um, let's see now here, I guess this, um, um, yes, here, I, I better be careful. Piano arithmetic is not by interpretable by, by ZF, but uh, um, let's see now here, I, I I'm kind of um, have to be a little careful when I'm saying what, what does this lack of inequality mean? Uh, so for the moment, just take that as to mean PA is not, uh, is not by interpretable with, with ZF. Uh, see PA, uh, if, if ZF is consistent, then PA can prove the consistency of each finite fragment of ZF. Uh, and then uh, using an overspill argument, you could go the other way around. But for the moment, I'll let this part go. Um, now, the idea of, uh, of interpretation, I, I just presented it in this uh, syntactic way, but there's also a semantic way of thinking about it, uh, which is satisfying to a model theorist. The idea is that an interpretation allows you to build uniformly models of one theory from another theory. So interpretation gives rise to an internal model construction that uniformly builds a model M superscript I um, of U for any M model of V. So you hand me a model M of V and I have this uniform way of constructing a model of the other theory. Uh, think about going back to this ZF and PA. I give you a model of ZF and you have this uniform way of looking at a set of natural numbers and therefore you can interpret piano arithmetic. Now, uh, to be a retract um, is, is a very, very important concept. I earlier said this means half of uh, by interpretability. It means you have translations, I and J of one theory to the other that you can come back in a way to the original place uh, with an isomorphism. So let's look at the, uh, uh, there's an inverse basically going on um, uh, in one direction. So um, U is a retract of V. If you have interpretations I and J of U into V and V into U, you can go from one theory to the other and, and you can come back. Um, and moreover, if you go, go forward, look at this part M J and then after that I. So if you go through J and then to go through I, you come back to um, a structure that is verifiably isomorphic to what you started with. So, so the idea is that you, you follow one translation with the, with the other one and you arrive at a structure which is verifiably in the first theory isomorphic to what, what we began with. Uh, so this is the kind of thing which doesn't happen, for example, in Google Translate. Um, you go from uh, Persian to English and then you from English to Persian, um, it's not going to come back to the original. So uh, typically, well, they will probably improve that down the road, but that, that's uh, maybe for some language it works better. But uh, um, I'll give you now some examples uh, in a moment about uh, these concepts I'm introducing. Now, by interpretable, it's just basically the best of both, both worlds. It means uh, these translations, you could, you could compose I with J and J with I 
and still come back to the same place. But by the same place, I mean isomorphism. And an isomorphism, that's not just externally existing, but it, there's a formula uh, in the relevant theories which, which gives you the isomorphism. So let's walk through this together. Um, so uh, two theories are bi-interpretable, written with this isomorphism symbol. If uh, there are interpretations I and J, uh, first of all, that witness U is a retract of V, so what was on the previous page. And additionally, um, there is a V formula G such that um, given an M model of U and N model of V, um, the interpretation of F in M gives you an isomorphism of M with M star, where as you see, M, M star is um, interpretation, the J interpretation followed by the I interpretation. And the other one works for the other direction. G super N is an isomorphism from M to N star. Uh, so this notion of, this notion, if you want to intuitively think of it um, as maybe just the first example that one could give in a very basic elementary uh, context, is if I give you a linear order, for example, as, just as a structure, and I just reverse the ordering, uh, then obviously I have made a different linear ordering, but you could, you could define one from the other. So essentially it's as if you're, Looking at an object, uh, uh, let's see, um, I will take now a pencil. Uh, and if I just turn it around upside down, still the same object, but of course it has different, it, you know, now the tip is on the top as opposed to the bottom. Uh, there's an idea of, of my interpretation is that um, you have moved things around and yet you can come back to, to, the, to the original place. So it's as if you're saying a cup is the same thing as a donut in topology. Uh, so it's it's that notion of of this of the, you have kept the essence of the structure you have uh, by by being able to go back and forth to, um, between the new structure and the old structure. These are the kind of uh, images that I can give you. Uh, my favorite one is the one I just gave you, the topological one about a donut and a cup, um, except it's the logician's version of, of a donut and a cup. Um, okay, so um, this this. Part of the slide emphasizes that uh, this notion is much stronger than mutual interpretability. Um, and, um, and a good example of, for example, two theories that are mutually interpretable, you could go both ways. You can interpret one and the other, uh, but not necessarily expect that you can come back is ZF and ZFC. Um, this is for um, basically a, a standard example that one sees in set theory, because you could always interpret the constructible universe um, in a given model of set theory. Um, um, in arithmetic, uh, it's piano arithmetic plus the extension of piano arithmetic uh, obtained by just adding the sentence that PA is not consistent. So, uh, so these two theories are uh, mutually interpretable, but they're not bi-interpretable. By Fisher's theorem, they're not bi-interpretable because uh, they're distinct extensions of, uh, of PA. Um, okay. So uh, a few more uh, basic items before we uh, come back and see uh, an outline of, of the proof of Fisher's theorem and then extensions thereof. Um, so P piano arithmetic is um, interpretable in ACA zero. Uh, so this is just routine and uh, basically involves just knowing what ACA zero is, but ACA zero is not interpretable in PA. So this is basically because ACA zero is finitely axiomatizable, that's fact number one. Fact number two, PA can prove the consistency of each of its finite sub-theories. And then fact number three, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. If you put these three, three things together, you'll be able to see that ACA zero is not interpretable in piano arithmetic, uh, even though it's a conservative ex extension of PA. Okay. The same type of argument works for ZF, zermelo frankel set theory, and gödel bernays uh, theory of classes. Um, exactly the same argument. Um, uh, coming to uh, some less known uh, examples, this first one I, I said was folklore. Um, uh, if you uh, let ZF minus uh, be the result of deleting the power set axiom from the axioms of zermelo frankel set theory, and here um, I'm, I'm having in mind zermelo frankel being formulated, not using replacement uh, as a scheme, but two schemes of collection and separation. It, it, it ends up making a difference um, uh, 
um, in this particular context, what ZF minus means. Uh, but if you just take out the, the power state axiom, then, then um, Mostovsky uh, back in the 50s uh, showed that um, there's a close connection between these extensions of ZF minus and uh, second order arithmetic and Kelly Moore's theory of classes. So let's look at it. Uh, this first one, for example, says, um, if you look at ZF minus plus an axiom which says everything is at most countable, everything is finite or, or countably infinite, uh, this theory, um, whose standard model, by the way, the standard model of this theory is the uh, collection of hereditarily countable sets, uh, H sub omega one is how set theories refer to it, uh, is by interpretable with um, an extension of, um, of a second order arithmetic. So Z2 is second order arithmetic. By second order arithmetic, of course, I mean the theory usually known as analysis or the, the first order theory, which is called second order arithmetic. Uh, it's exactly what's studied in subsystems of um, and reverse mathematics of second order arithmetic. Except that here you have to also add a scheme of choice um, for each natural, basically the scheme of choice, an arbitrary scheme of choice. This pi one infinity basically is just a, the technical notation for it. Uh, it ends up um, being the case that this scheme of choice in the translation corresponds to the collection holding on the left on the left hand side. Okay. Now, if you uh, change this um, axiom that everything is countable to everything at most has power kappa, where kappa is inaccessible, then uh, that ends up giving you uh, Kelly Morse. Uh, theory of classes with a corresponding scheme of, of choice. So uh, in this theorem of Mostovsky, we're seeing second order arithmetic and second order set theory having very uh, interesting counterparts um, in, in, in terms of ZF minus. Um, okay, um, let me go down, let's see. Um, this allows me now to uh, define uh, these three notions. These three notions, as you see, one of them is tightness and one of them is solidity, uh, is going to allow uh, the, the results I wanna to present to go, to go smoother. So solidity um, is um, a notion which is um, best understood um, model theoretically. Basically, it means that if you have um, a theory, a theory is said to be solid, if it has the following property, if you take any three models of, of T, um, M, M star, and N, and um, the model M can parametrically interpret N. So parametrically interpret N is just a slightly stronger way of, allow, or I should say a, 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 a more uh, lenient way of, of allowing interpretability because you allow the formulas defining the relevant objects to also have parameters. So. Uh, so this is, a, this is just a slight technical thing added here to, to allow even the theorem to be stronger or the notion to be, to be um, yeah, more easygoing. So if you have a way of interpreting uh, N in M and a way of interpreting uh, M star in N, uh, these three structures, and you happen to have an isomorphism that is definable in M between the first model and the last model, then there's, there must be an isomorphism also between the first model and the, the middle model. So the sandwiching phenomena going on. Basically. If M and M star are, can be viewed, can be verifiably isomorphic from the point of view of M, then M should be able to already verify that it's isomorphic to the middle model. That's solidity. Uh, neatness, uh, this should, uh, definition of neatness should uh, remind you of, uh, of the statement of Albert Fischer's theorem, because the statement of Fischer's theorem was that any two re, any two, for any two extensions of piano arithmetic, if U is a retract of V, then V is a subset of U. So we're gonna call that a theory being neat. So Albert showed that piano arithmetic is neat. Um, and, uh, and tightness is in terms of um, Yes, that was not a question. Um, so, um, so um, tightness is uh, is also, as you see, syntactically um, 
um, syntactic property of T, um, meaning you could just say uh, a theory is tight if uh, there's no, no way to extend the theory in two different ways and for these two extensions to be bi-interpretable. So uh, theory is tight if uh, as soon as you have uh, extensions U and V of T, then uh, U is equal to V. Um, it's a, very easy to see that neatness implies uh, tightness. That's just uh, like a one line, not even one line, half a line. It takes a little more work, but, but it's also easy to show that solidity implies neatness. So this way, uh, this is actually how Albert proved PA is, uh, is uh, solid, except that he didn't use this terminology. You know? So I basically have extracted these from, from, from Albert's proof. Um, so basically, if you want to prove a theory is tight, then uh, a lot of arguments are easier to handle um, if you, um, at least for me, because uh, I mostly think model theoretically, uh, if I just can, can show some solidity. Uh, what's nice also about these notions is that they are uh, invariant under by interpretations. If you have shown a theory to, to have one of these properties, then, uh, and then the same holds for any theory that is by interpretable for the same theory. I haven't sat down to see if there are counterexamples for the reverse going back. Uh, there probably are, but um, at least in the natural theories I've looked at, I haven't seen a counterexample. Uh, but I, I suspect one can cook up uh, examples where you these implications are. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, these implications are both not reversible. Um, okay, with this in mind, uh, with the, this background in mind, let's now take a quick look at um, an the outline of um, Visser's theorem about PA being solid. So the idea is as follows. You, uh, how do we, what does it mean to be solid? It means that if you have three models, um, M, N, and M star, such that uh, M can cook up internally a copy of N, and N can cook up internally a copy of M star. Um, and these are all three uh, models of, of PA. Um, then there is an M definable isomorphism from the first model. Um, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I, I think I was going a bit a bit too fast. Let's start. Let me let me let me let me go back here. Uh, this is this is what we want to show solidity. Okay. Um, so. Um, with, with that in mind, uh, let's, let's continue. So I, I have three models, M, M star, and N. Um, then right away, just by basic elementary facts about piano arithmetic, um, M can um, define an, basically an, an embedding of itself um, into an initial segment of, of, uh, of M star. Um, let's see, there's an M definable isomorphism from M to a star. Um, PA has the key feature that if M is a model of PA and N is a model of just uh, PA minus without the induction axioms or even Robinson's Q would be sufficient. Then as soon as um, N can be interpreted in M, then there is an M definable initial embedding from M to N. Um, so the idea here is that um, just like in the, in the real world, if I give you a model of arithmetic, you say it's if they're standard, or it's non-standard, which means if it's non-standard, it has an initial segment, which is a copy of uh, the standard natural numbers. Internally, if arithmetic, piano arithmetic is also smart enough to know that. Um, if it can define a model that, um, that which has a property that every element has, a, has something larger than it, then it can embed in itself. The model can embed itself into an initial segment of the model that it has described. Um, so this, this allows you to get uh, two um, embeddings uh, from M to N and from N to M star. Um, and they both have to be surjective um, because if they're not, then um, you could um, compose them together, have an embedding from M to M star, this is the composition, and then come back through um, I zero, and that we have defined a proper initial segment of M with no last element. 
So uh, this is the kind of um, proof that if I had more time, if I, I would draw a picture and once I draw, if you draw the picture for it, you see exactly how you could, you could see it in one go. But the idea is that if J0 or J1, if one of them was not subjective, then the initial model would be able to find a, a, a cut of itself. It could define a cut of itself with no last element. And we know PA uh, can never allow that. Piano arithmetic basically, uh, because of the induction action being around, doesn't allow for such a situation to happen. Um, so um, this basically, this contradiction shows that, that the middle model must be isomorphic to the first model. Now, um, let's see um, here. It looks like I can now go back to this slide because it looks like I skipped a slide, which is which is actually not bad because this is the right time to be also looking at it. Um, the um, uh, one of the slides that I went over, which um, at, which connects PA to to set theory, actually at this point uh, allows us to see that another theory is also solid. Um, consider the theory um, ZF fin. Uh, which is the result of replacing the action of infinity in ZF by its negation. So this is sometimes called finite state theory. So um, by uh, it's basically, it's, it's now known, um, but it took a long time to, for this to, to, to become as, as known as it is now, that, that piano arithmetic is bi-interpretable with the result of strengthening ZF fin with an axiom TC. TC is for transitive closure. It means every set has a transitive closure. You see, in set theory, uh, to, to, to form the transitive closure of a set, um, you want to get, you start with the set, it takes its elements, then its elements, then its elements, and at some point you want to take a union of these things. Uh, for that, you need the action of infinity. So piano arithmetic, of course, uh, or ZF fin doesn't have the action of infinity. So it cannot prove TC, but, 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 but you could, if you add TC to ZF fin, then it becomes bi interpretable with PA. The seed for this theorem goes back to, uh, to the work of Ackerman in 1940, um, where the famous Ackerman coding, uh, the dyadic coding, where you code finite sets by zero one sequence was born. Um, then in a uh, very, um, um, appears to be very little read paper of Michelsky. Uh, Michelsky was able to show that Ackerman's interpretation is invertible. Um, I think the purpose is written in a, yeah, in, in a Russian journal and it's also in Russian. Um, so uh, it, it was known among um, a sub-community of, of logicians who were familiar with, uh, with the language. Uh, and then it was rediscovered and uh, popularized in a paper by Kay and Wong in 2007. Um, so now we have uh, basically um, this as a very standard um, important result. Uh, now, it is true that if you talk to, uh, to many logicians, they, they know that these two theories are almost the same, but usually what they mean by almost the same is mutual interpretability. It turns out to get the by interpretability, you have to be really careful, and that's why I'm giving these references. Um, in a paper that uh, Albert and I and Jim Schmuel wrote together, um, we showed that uh, this TC here is really important, uh, that if you drop TC, then uh, by interpretability fails. However, uh, half of it survives. Uh, PA is a retract of ZF fin. But uh, looking at this part, PA and uh, ZF fin and TC being by interpretable and me going forward, um, that's how we deduce that this other theory is also solid. So now we have two examples of solid theories, piano arithmetic and, uh, and uh, this extension of finite set theory. Now the plot thickens. Um, inspired by, by, uh, by these results, um, I became very curious to see the extent to which you could prove other theories are, are solid. And uh, I, uh, in the paper that I, at the very beginning of the talk I referred to, uh, I um, showed that a second order arithmetic zermelo frankel set theory, kelly Moore's theory of classes, and also higher order analogs of second order arithmetic and KM 
are also solid. By, by high order, I mean, for example, third order arithmetic, fourth order arithmetic, etc., or third order set theory uh, or class theory, etc. Um, I should point out that the solidity of ZF was proved independently by uh, joint work of uh, Albert Friedman. Um, it also was uh, proved independently by Fyodor Pachomov. Um, and uh, it was again rediscovered by Hamkins and Freyer. Um, but to my knowledge, none of, none of those were, were written up. So I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this because I, lear I learned about these discoveries uh, uh, afterwards. Um, so, so this is, is rather remarkable because uh, the, 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 the proofs of, um, of the solidity of these theories seem to use the entire power of these theories. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get to some conjectures and questions about basically, uh, perhaps solidity is, is an indication of naturality. They're natural stopping places in the development of our, uh, of our axiomatic theories. Um, um, so other examples of solid theories include um, the theory obtained by deleting infinity, but not necessarily replacing it with this negation and adding TC. So this is a sub theory of zermelo franco set theory. This, is, um, um, this can be proved uh, by using the solidity of ZF, the solidity of TA and a beautiful theorem of of, of Albert that shows that um, no extension of ZF is a reduct of an, any extension of PA and vice versa. So if you put these three, three theorems together, you get the uh, solidity of, of this sub theory of, 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 of uh, ZF. Another interesting theory that is a uh, solid, um, which is also somehow canonical, is what um, Raman Cossack at some point called Tarski arithmetic, and I, I really like the name, so I'm using it again. It seems to be a nice name for the extension of PA with a truth predicate T that satisfies Tarski's conditions, and um, and also you have induction available in the extended language. So the standard model of this theory, Tarski arithmetic, is the standard model of arithmetic. Uh, so we have n plus times, and then adjoin the the truth predicate for natural numbers to it, uh, then that becomes the standard model of, of Tarski arithmetic. So that also happens to be a, a solid theory. Um, I'm going to just say a few words about the outline of these proofs. Um, the proofs, you have to check a lot of details, but at least I can, I can provide some outline. So for Z2, for example, the first stage of the proof proceeds just like in the proof of the solidity of piano arithmetic. Um, it, uh, now, what's, what's a little confusing about second arithmetic is that you have two sorts of objects. You have the numbers uh, of the model and you have sets of the model. And when you have an interpretation of, let's say, of another model of second order arithmetic in this model of second order arithmetic you began with, uh, it's quite legitimate that maybe you've used some of the numbers and some of the sets as your new numbers, meaning your new numbers need not be a basically uh, a subset or all of uh, definable in terms of the old numbers. They might be a combination of the old numbers and the old sets, but nevertheless, um, if, you, if you sit down and kind of work it out, uh, you still can carry out the first, basic the proof of solidity of PA and, and at least find um, an isomorphism between uh, N and M and M star and N that are definable in the relevant uh, structures. Um, and uh, you could also show that what you see here is K zero hat, uh, this one, is the extension of, of the isomorphism to the corresponding second order structure. So once you have the isomorphism of the first order structures, then you can lift it to the, to the, uh, to the second order structure. And uh, by, by chasing the diagrams around, um, and this is where I'm just waving my hand, obviously, but just to give you a feeling, um, you actually can define um, a map K hat, which begins with the model MA, model of second arithmetic, and comes back to itself. Um, and what's lovely about second order arithmetic um, is that it, it knows that um, 
there is no automorphism of the natural numbers that is definable in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the structure. So meaning the natural numbers are rigid, even if you allow the automorphism to be definable using reals or reusing the classes. So, so as opposed to the case of PA, where the linchpin of the argument was that PA has a property that it cannot allow a proper cut to be definable. Here, the linchpin, there are really two linchpins. It's basically the linchpin of PA plus the linchpin of the fact that um, you have rigidity. Um, you, you cannot move numbers around in a definable way. Uh, the model might have an automorphism, but it's not definable even if you allow classes or, or reals in this definition. Um, for ZF, um, oops, let's see. Uh, looks like I went straight to, um, I, I, I guess I, I skipped the, uh, the um, outline of, of ZF. Uh, for ZF, if there is time, I'll say a few words, but uh, let me now move to some conjectures and questions, which are gonna lead to some, some results about that are, uh, I mentioned earlier that are unpublished. Um, so looking at this, the results I just showed you, uh, um, the, I, and, I'm, and I also mentioned that it, it appears that tightness is, 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 is allowing us to have a language for a natural stopping point of the theory or, or naturality of the theory. Uh, so in some interesting way, the topic of this talk and the previous talk by James Walsh are, um, are pursuing in a way uh, related themes um, is that maybe there's a reversal. Maybe you have a sequential theory. And remember a sequential theory basically is a theory which um, has a girdle beta function that you could define in it or has available. Then if it's tight, um, does it prove the full scheme of induction over its natural numbers? Because all the examples that we have um, basically uh, have this property, but I, I haven't been able to see how to go back. Um, and a special case of, the, of, of this first question or conjecture. So I've, I'm posing you with questions, but the conjecture is that all of them have a yes answer. Is that, is it true that no proper sub theory of PA is tight? In other words, if the deductive closure of T is a subset of the deductive closure of PA and T is tight, then do T and PA have the same deductive closure? Is T just PA basically? Does, does PA have, uh, is there any sub theory of PA which is not uh, tight? That's a special case of problem number one. Um, and then you can ask the same kind of question about ZF. ZF is, is tight because it's solid. The proofs of, of solidity that, that we have available use all the axioms. You know, it looks like they're using all the axioms of, of, of ZF. Um, so it's natural to ask, you know, is there a proper sub theory? Now, I have already shown you a proper sub theory, and, and this proper sub theory is basically a fork in the road. Remember, if you have this theory that I'm pointing to, ZF without infinity plus TC, uh, then it, because you've taken out infinity, uh, there's a fork in the road. You could either add infinity or it's negation. If you add infinity, you get ZF. If you add negation of infinity, you get basically PA. Uh, so that's, so besides this fork in the road, is there any other sub theory of ZF that is tight? And, uh, and then more grandly, uh, perhaps there's a classification theorem for sequential type theories. Uh, maybe they've been classified in terms of ordinals or in, because of, uh, or in terms of uh, uh, these uh, canonical foundational theories that we have. I'm going to now show you some partial evidence about uh, uh, the answers being, being positive. So already in, in the 2016 paper, uh, I pointed out that if you take out extensionality or foundation from ZF one at a time, but then the theories that you get are not tight. Um, also, um, based on the results that appeared in the paper by Albert Fisser and Jim Schmerl and I, uh, that I referred to earlier in the talk, uh, ZF fin uh, is not tight. Uh, so let me go. Um, uh, so ZF fin, remember, is this theory plus, plus the negation of infinity. But if you just have ZF fin without 
without TC that is not tight. Um, and then um, the unpublished results are here, which don't have dates, uh, three and four. Uh, no finitely axiomatized subtheory of PA or of ZF is tight. Indeed, for each natural number n, the pi n consequences of PA, if you take that as a theory, or the pi n consequences of ZF, if you take that as a theory, fail to be tight. So when I, and so as you noted, I was reading um, this symbol PA sub PN as the pi n consequences of whatever pi n was sitting underneath them. I'll give you an idea about the proof here. Um, <clears throat> also, ACA zero is not tight. The same goes for, for GB. Um, and uh, in the recent paper, the JSL paper that I referred to at the beginning of the talk, Hamkins and Frere show that uh, removing power set from ZF results in a non-tight theory. And also Zermelo set theory is not tight. So, uh, so these are basically showing that if you take one axiom at a time or schemes at a time, uh, you, you obtain um, non-tight theories. Um, or if you look at finitely axiomatizable Sub theories, um, but uh, what what they what it's they leave um, open is maybe you have a sub theory of PA which doesn't fall into one of these categories, and you know, so this is the but but the results we're looking at is that if we look at some like every natural sub theory of ZF or PA we're looking at it's is not tight. Right? Now the idea of the proof of three. Let me remind you, three is this result about the fact that uh, no finite fragment of PA or ZF is tight. So in a way that it, it, it's a matter of, of, of knowing some classical work in, in model theory of arithmetic, which goes back a long time ago. Uh, so uh, more than 40 years ago, about 43 years ago. Um, so it, about the same time in Manchester, um, Kirby and Paris, and um, so Laurie Kirby, Jeff Paris, and Hamid Lesson, who was a PhD student there, um, realize something remarkable about what happens if you um, look at the set of definable elements of model of arithmetic that are definable by just sigma n formulas. So k sub n of m is a set of definable, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sub model of, of the universe of m consisting of sigma n definable uh, elements. And, um, Let's see. Um, so uh, the, the so this first theory I'm, I'm I'm pointing to here basically says that uh, k sub n of m is a pi n elementary submodel of n. Uh, here, this num number n is a natural number which is assumed to be positive, and therefore k sub of k sub n of m satisfies the pi n plus one theory of of m. Um, and in particular, k sub n of m satisfies the pi n plus one consequences of PA. Um, and uh, the amount of induction it satisfies is uh, pi sigma n minus one. But importantly, it doesn't satisfy a particular um, fragment of collection. It, um, this B stands for bounding, it's, it's collection, the collection scheme for sigma n formula. So, so uh, it, it, up, it satisfies PA up to a point, but, but not from, from a certain point on. So this, this is classical, this is this part. Uh, what is lesser known is, is what's in um, Hamid Lesson's thesis uh, is this second result. The standard cut omega, the set of natural numbers is first order definable in, in Kn of n. Uh, again, n is assumed to be a positive number greater than zero. So it, by arithmetizing Lesson's theorem, uh, one can show um, that for each natural number n, the standard model of PA is bi-interpretable uh, with a non-standard model of the form Kn of m, where m is a non-standard model of PA. So the standard model is bi-interpretable with a model of a fragment of PA. Any fragment that you specify is, is possible. So for any pair m and n, uh, of numbers, uh, natural numbers, you could find elementarily inequivalent non-standard models M0 of the pi M consequences of PA and M1 of the pi N consequences. 
such that um, they are bi-interpretable. Why are they bi-interpretable? Because they have this uh, middleman, so to speak, instead of the, the standard model, the standard model becomes a middleman. They're both bi-interpretable with, 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 the, uh, with the standard model and therefore they're bi-interpretable um, by going through Lessons theorem, uh, which shows uh, the failure of uh, solidity for PA sub uh, pi n. Um, remember solidity was a model theoretic condition, but if you just work a little bit harder, just looking at the arguments, uh, you could even show the failure of tightness. So usually if you can show something is not solid, in all the examples I know of, by working a little harder, you could also show it's not tight. Um, and a similar idea works, um, this Lesson's argument basically works for models of ZF plus V equals to L. So, so that's pretty much what allows you to lift the this kind of argument to also the context of uh, ZF. Um, so I'm, I'm, I know my time is almost up and I'm also towards my last slides. Um, so let me give, give you an idea of uh, a proof of four. I should remind you what four was. Four is that uh, ACL zero is not tight and also GB is not tight. Bertel Bernays theory of classes. So again, I, I wanna show you an argument which is showing failure of solidity. And then the same kind of argument can be fine tuned to show a failure of uh, tightness. So I would like to describe two extensions of, uh, of ACA. Now notice I'm saying ACA and not ACA zero. So to show something is not tight, all I have to show to you is two extensions of it that are bi-interpretable, but not the same. So I'm going to go to ACA. Now ACA is the result of adding full scheme of induction to ACA zero. So as opposed to ACA zero, which is finitely axiomatizable, ACA is provably not. Um, and uh, these extensions I call ACA atomic and ACA generic. So ACA atomic is ACA plus an axiom that ensures that each class, which means it's each set, uh, is arithmetical, i.e. definable in the ambient model of arithmetic. Now, it is well known, um, and I think um, Saul Pfefferman was one of the people who first noticed this, is that ACA and Tarski arithmetic are intimately connected. They're mutually interpretable. And actually, one is a redux of the other one, but they're not bi-interpretable. Um, however, um, the, so the idea about being able to formulate ACA atomic, and atomic basically because the model is atomic in the sense of, of model theory, everything is definable. Um, and by think everything here, I mean the sets, uh, is that in, in, in ACA, you can define a truth predicate, a Tarskian truth predicate, which satisfies induction. And using that truth predicate, you could, you could actually say that everything, every set I'm looking at is definable in the sense of the truth predicate. So this axiom, so ACA atomic can be formulated using the truth predicate that ACA um, gives rise to. So this is, this is pretty standard, uh, the fact that you could do that. Now, the interesting one is the generic version of ACA. Um, you see, once you have ACA and you have, therefore you have a truth predicate, uh, the truth predicate can define a generic. And by generic, I mean a Cohen generic subset of, of natural numbers. Of course, by Cohen generic, I, people also refer to as Pfefferman generic because in the context of natural numbers uh, or piano arithmetic, Pfefferman was the one who first noticed that he could define generics and do interesting things with them. So there is a generic that is definable also in ACA. And because of the truth and forcing being at work, you could also have an axiom which says that everything is definable um, First of all, there's an arithmetically generic class among your classes, and that each class is definable in, uh, in this expanded structure. So as opposed to just being definable in N, uh, it's, 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 defined, it's basically definable from, from, this, from G. Now, um, with an argument going back to uh, Mostovsky, uh, you could define the standard cut in 
in ACA atomic and ACA generic. This gives rise to, to lemma one, um, basically, and lemma two, um, that each of these um, is biinterpretable with Tarski arithmetic. And therefore, they're right, they're, they're, so the middleman here is Tarski arithmetic. And therefore, they're biinterpretable. Uh, but they have distinct deductive closures because you know one of them says every set is definable in N, the other one says there is a generic, of course, a generic cannot be defined. Um, and I believe this is uh, the end of the slide. And I, as you see, want to thank Albert Visser, who uh, beautifully showed exactly which, which mountains should be climbed.